But we've done uh, a number of these explorations to try to find uh, sunken warships. So we, we try to do these both um, as, as really exciting examples of uh, underwater archaeology and, and as tributes to the, the brave men that went down on these ships. Once we find a target on the bottom of the ocean, then we send down an ROV to go down to the bottom uh, and take high-definition video of, uh, of what we find. So we're, ex we're looking forward, we're excited to do a, a, a video feed from the bottom of the ocean, like we did with the Musashi, to, sh to, show, to show everybody what the wreck looks like now. The petrol itself and its capabilities and the assets we've got and, and the research we've done are the culmination of you know, two years worth of hard work. And we've put all this together in a single package that is you know, um, one among two or three on the planet. What's different now is that um, there's new information that's come to light is, is early on during Indianapolis's voyage, she crossed or came in close proximity to another Navy vessel. And so there was, there was noted contact in their log. So they knew, they were able to fix a place in time where the Indianapolis was. And so with that new information, it actually drives our, our search grid or our survey area a little bit further to the west than what you know, the previous research had led them to go. I would prefer people to focus on the heroism and the valor of the crew, uh, which actually began long before the ship was torpedoed and sunk. Uh, she had 10 battle stars in some of the most brutal combat uh, throughout the entire course of the Pacific War. Even in a, in a great tragedy like this one, there is valor, there is bravery, uh, there are also lessons learned, uh, in this case many of them, uh, that need to be preserved and remembered. Uh, and in the case of this crew that made the ultimate sacrifice, you know, what they did needs to be remembered and, and not just for getting torpedoed and sunk. They, they, they were heroes. Her commanding officer, Captain McVeigh, in my view, he's, he's a hero. Uh, like I said, he made, took a calculated risk. The Japanese submarine got lucky and he didn't. That's the, that's the fortunes of war. But I think when you look at what he did when he was in the water, you know, he survived the sinking. <clears throat> he was in command of a raft. The survivors were scattered about, but he was, there were a number of them within eye shot of where he was. And you could say, well, he would be just another man in the water trying to survive. And that was a horrific ordeal for anyone to survive. But he never relinquished command. You know, he was in charge of everything that he could see. He maintained discipline. Uh, he issued orders that resulted in saving people's lives uh, and, and, and maintained command. You know, you could forgive him for going, you know, he, he was just trying to stay alive. He didn't, he didn't act that way at all. Uh, and because of what he did, more of the crew are alive than would have been otherwise. And in my mind, it's one thing to show great leadership when everything is going good, but to show that kind of leadership under the most horrific of circumstances to me is, is extraordinary. And to me, that's why, you know, the man is, is always a hero. All the paperwork is lost. There was no distress signal that went out. So basically, we have nothing but the recollections of the crew, the survivors. So it's, it was really an imprecise location at the beginning. When Captain McVeigh was picked up, First thing he said, we were exactly as rooted. So it, he was saying they were exactly where they were supposed to be. So that is where the Navy position came from. Like plugging all the data in, that's probably where Indianapolis should have been. Uh, but we don't have any of the supporting, you know, historical documents. Their deck logs were gone, all their records were gone. They spent four days in the water afterwards. Uh, a lot of the primary actors didn't live through it. So it's, as a historian, there are a lot of missing pieces into that that original sinking location. So uh, with LST 779, it's important to give you another data plot in that, in that route. I mean, they reportedly were passed by Indianapolis around 1,200, 1,300, anywhere between 12 and 1,400 on the day of the sinking. So about 11 hours before Indianapolis was sunk. So that gives you, if you can figure out where LST 779 was, that gives you another point on that, another data point on that route that can give you a better idea. 
technology and, and computer scientists helps a lot with doing this this type of renavigation and um, in, in drift modeling. And a lot of that comes out of the uh, oil spill industry as well, too, because there's people are trying to track oil spills and where they're going to end up and predict uh, you know, how, where they're going to go and what they're going to impact. And so using some of this software, you can, you can also apply it to shipwrecks uh, as well, too. Go! Bridge, AUV descending. Hertz, and there is a 6135. Yeah.